Today we have Parasha Bayira. He appeared. And this Parasha is Parasha number four as we begin the new cycle of the Torah. And I'm excited um, because we, we are actually beginning, and, and, and this is very crucial for all of us as, as we are starting a, a new beginning in our lives. And this is the foundation of those who fear Hashem. And Bayira represents something very important for everyone who is looking up to Hashem as our Father and those who are looking to be obedient and having a relationship with Hashem. He appeared his name for an event that took place in the life of Abraham. Why? Because Hashem appears to him. Previously, God had appeared to Abraham, not Abraham. He had appeared to Abraham and changed his name to Abraham. Formerly, his name was Abraham, which was exalted father. And he changed his name to Abraham, father of multitudes. And that is very significant. Significant for you and for me. Significant for Israel as a nation. Because many times you hear this expression, Abraham Avinu. Abraham Avinu. Abraham, our father. And that really encapsulates these principles that the parasha is bringing to our lives. Today I pray that all of us can understand what is the meaning of this expression, Abraham Avinu. Abraham, our father, this is not a simple everyday expression, even though so many times we have the tendency to use and abuse words. And sometimes we just say it and we totally neglect the meaning and the background and what the effect should be. For instance, many times you hear people calling you and saying, oh, God bless you, as if this is like, hey, hi and bye. When in reality, we are calling upon the name of Hashem. And when we say, God bless you, there must be meaning and it has an effect. And so when we say Abraham Avinu, our father Abraham, it's a very important expression. And it's not just an expression, it's a statement. We are making a statement. And this is significant because this is going to bring us back to this reality. Is Abraham your father and my father? Why is it that Hashem changes Abraham's, um, Abraham's name to Abraham? And why is this expression so important? And why is it that Hashem now is appearing to Abraham once more? Well, the word of the Lord declares in the same chapter of Genesis, in verse 19, and he says, For I have made myself known to him, so that he will give orders to his children and to his household after him to keep the way of Adonai and to do what is right and just, so that Adonai may bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. It's a bilateral, contractual um, equation, if you will. God promised to Father Abraham that he would be father of many nations, but in order for that to take place, there are some components that, that um, are to be followed so that this can become a reality. This is what we call the everlasting covenant. Notice that I, I mentioned earlier today the Beisham Rubenei Israel. It says, from one new moon to another and from one Shabbat to another, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. Israel as a nation is a statement of Hashem's faithfulness. The Sabbath and the new moons are a statement of Hashem's faithfulness. He is always fulfilling his, his part, but there is another element that sometimes we are missing. It's our part. In our part, we need to understand that we are very, very active in order for this to take place. And in order for this to be an everlasting covenant, so I want you to think for a moment, how can a covenant become everlasting? Think for a moment. 
if I make a covenant with you and I tell you this is going to be everlasting covenant. Well, for the record, we must understand that people are in our days are the, uh, the life expectancy goes up to probably 90 years or, or a little bit less, depending on on our habits, eating habits and so on and so forth. Uh, today, it, it is said that people are living longer than before, although I kind of disagree. I think that people lived longer before than today. But in any event, so we we can see that the, the expectancy of life of a person may be 90 years give or take. And so if I make a covenant with you and I say this is going to be an everlasting covenant, or if, if God is making a covenant with me, and if I die when I'm 90, what happened to the everlasting covenant? How does that represent an everlasting covenant? And that is the question. And the question and the answer, you know, in order for a covenant to become everlasting, the answer is midor vador. In other words, from generation to generation. And this is why the Eternal One, blessed be He, visits Abraham and Sarah to announce the birth of Yitzhak, Isaac. God is going to perpetuate this beautiful covenant from generation to generation. And if you can envision, if you can picture links, Put it this way, if we put one link and then we connect with another link and so on and so forth, then we can have a, an everlasting covenant. The problem, however, is when one of those links is not fulfilling its part and is disconnected, then the, the covenant cannot be everlasting, which means that each generation, all of us, are very important. Israel is very important, significantly important to keep up with the ways of Abraham. The Lord said, because I know I can entrust, I mean, I can, I can trust that, that Abraham will teach his household and after him to keep the ways of Adonai and to do what is right and what is just in order for that to take place, for the promise to be fulfilled. And so... Now, Hashem, Adonai, appears to Abraham. And then we read on the first reading from this parasha, Ba'ira elav Adonai ve'elonei mamre, behu yoshep etach ha'ochel kechom hayom. God appeared to Abraham in the plains of Mamre while he was sitting in the entrance, at the entrance of the tent in the hottest part of the day. Adonai appeared to, uh, to Abraham. And so, he appears to him, but this, this is very significant. And I'm, I'm excited because you must think about it. You know how many times people are always looking into the occult? And you know why people are so drawn into the occult? It's because they're looking for that supernatural aspect, that, that experience. People are always looking, and, and I don't know, we have different uh, uh, denominations of, within the, Christian, uh, the classical Christian community. And then there is one that um, is always looking into that um, charismatic experience. And then some of those branches of, 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 you know, the traditional Christianity have labeled themselves as, as charismatic. And people that are always looking for that supernatural experience. And you know how many people are drawn and in, into that which is forbidden. That's because they're always looking for that special experience feeling and, ex and, and experience. Well, guess what? Many times we, we don't realize that the, the Hashem has actually visited us and that and the Hashem is, is so near to us and we're always looking for something, in my words, that, I never, that we never lost to begin with. And so Abraham is, is, is actually in his tent, the hottest day of the day, and, and Adonai appears to him that is significant and this is this is something that should open up our eyes and, and should help us to visualize and see that what is about to take place had everlasting repercussions and so when we have communion with God we must think of it this way because Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not just living their lives in a way that, oh, well, you know, I, I pray, I hope. No, 
they had a long-term vision. They had a very clear understanding of the Olam Chaseh. Abraham Avinu had a clear understanding and he was not settling for less. He never lived in a city. He was always living in tents. And he was always going from place to place in the promised land. And the word of the Lord declares that's because of his um, because of his uh, vision, he said he was looking for a city not built by human hands, by the hands of God himself. In other words, he's looking for the new Jerusalem. And the new Jerusalem is when God's glory will be actually manifest on earth. That is long-term vision. Interestingly enough, I got to tell you, the first time I, uh, when I went to Egypt, um, my mind was blown away when I saw the pyramids for the first time in person. Um, and what really got my attention a lot was the fact that it took years. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, some of the uh, some of the pharaohs died even before seeing the pyramid to be completed. And that's what really blew my mind away, because it takes long term vision to determine to edify a building like that and this isn't this this is someone who has a vision and so Abraham Yitzhak and Yaakov have this type of vision and this is very significant because as you can tell I'm actually identifying Abraham's traits and this is very significant and that is the point of this parashat today and so but be, beginning with Isaac each new generation must keep the way of Adonai and do what is right and just, so Adonai may bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. In other words, Abraham has done his part. Isaac has done his part. Jacob has done his part. Now it's up to us to do our part. And so, in the first century, when Messiah Yeshua, commonly known as Jesus, the Messiah, confronts the religious leaders about their practices, about what was right and what was just, they replied with an expression. And it has to do with this expression. And let me read from the Orthodox Jewish Bible in uh, John chapter 8, verse 39 and 40. They answered, these are the religious leaders, and said unto him, Avinu hu Abraham, Abraham is our father. And Rebbe Melech HaMoshiach says to them, If you were Yeladim of Abraham, you would have been doing the Maaseh Abraham. But now you are seeking to kill me, a man who has told you how I met the truth, which I heard from Hashem. And this was not a Maaseh that Abraham did. And so, Yeshua the Messiah confronts the religious leaders and the religious leaders uh, filled with pride and say, well, you know, we're the seed of Abraham. And they said, Avinu hu Abraham is our father. And we are, we're so proud about it that Abraham is our father. And Rabbi Melech HaMoshiach says, if you were Yeladim of Abraham, if you were the children of Abraham, you would be doing the Maaseh Abraham. You would be doing the deeds of Abraham. And that is what it means to call upon Abraham Avinu. To call Abraham our father, there is one requisite. And that requisite is to do the deeds of Abraham. And so let me read from the complete Jewish Bible. They answer him, Our father is Abraham. Yeshua replied, If you are children of Abraham, then do the things Abraham did. As it is, you are out to kill me, a man who has told you the truth, which I heard from God or Mashem. Abraham did nothing like that. You are doing the things your father does. And then they said, We're not Ill Ill illegitimate children. They said to him, We have only one father, God. And Yeshua the Messiah replied to them, If God were your father, you would love me because I came out from God, and I have arrived here, and I did not come on my own. He sent me. Why don't you understand what I'm saying? Because you can't bear to listen to the message. You belong to your father, indeed, Satan. 
and you want to carry out your father's desires. From the start, he was a murderer, and he has never stood by the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he is speaking in character. Listen to that. Because he is a liar, indeed the inventor of, of the lie. But as for me, because I tell you the truth, you don't believe me. Which one of you can show me where I'm, I'm wrong? I am telling you the truth. Why don't you believe me? And so this is important. Then we have a problem right here. So who are the children of Abraham? Who are the children of Abraham? If these people in the first century who were biologically speaking, children of Abraham, the Messiah is actually saying, no, Abraham is not your father. Your father is Satan. And you're calling God your father. No, God is not your father. How is this possible? It's possible because, because of what we do. It's possible because of the traits that are a reflection in our lives. Let me remind you that the word of the Lord declares in the book of uh, Genesis, in the beginning when God created Adam and Eve, our fathers, we, and, and notice what I said, our fathers, because we descend from them and because we have traits and characteristics, human characteristics that are actually stemming from them. And so we were actually created in the image of God. Therefore, we must be a reflection of God on earth. And so we're going to learn how these traits were actually present in, in the life of Abraham. And so Rabbi Shaul, commonly known as the Apostle Paul, in the Brick Hadashah, in what people call the New Testament or the Apostolic Writings, um, we find in the book of Galatians, chapter 3, verses 1 to 8, from the complete Jewish Bible. And it, he's writing to a kehilah, he's writing to a community. And this community were not necessarily Jewish. Um, this community was actually comprised of those who were joining Judaism of the first century through Messiah. They came to know Messiah, and so they accepted Yeshua as the Messiah, of Israel, and then and then they were joining to practice Messianic Judaism or Judaism of the first century um, in the light and understanding of Messiah. But then something happened, and some of the people of this community um, took it, it took a different shift, and they were thinking that they could become children of Abraham by uh, by applying the legalistic observances of Judaism. And don't get me wrong, um, there is nothing wrong if, if some people are practicing that. We have different lifestyles. We have people within Judaism. We have the Reformed community. We have the Orthodox community. We have the ultra-Orthodox community. We have the Hasidic, the Haredim, um, and so on and so forth. And those are lifestyles. Those are a set of rules that people are actually embracing as their uh, way of living. The problem with that is when people are looking for justification through those deeds. And that is the problem. Um, the Torah is actually uh, telling us that we must help those who are in need. And that is a mitzvah. And we do that. But the problem is when we take it upon ourselves and we are bragging about it, then that mitzvah is no longer valid because we are bragging about it. So we're doing it to be seen. And that is the problem. So that is the context of, that we actually find in the book of Galatians. And so Rabbi Shaul writes to them, and, and, and he's kind of harsh. And then he is addressing this issue in, in the way it's, it's supposed to be confronted. And so let me read from the complete Jewish Bible. You stupid Galatians, who has put you under a spell? Before your very eyes, Yeshua the Messiah was clearly portrayed as having been put to death as a criminal meaning fulfilling the promise that he was going to be executed as a criminal. And we find that in the book of Isaiah. I want to know from you just this one thing. Did you receive the Spirit, capital S, this is the Spirit of Hashem, by legalistic observance of Torah commands or by trusting in what you heard and being faithful to it? In other words, are you being... 
redeemed and, and, and elevated before Hashem because of trust or because of your legal observances? And so he asks another question again, are you that stupid? Having begun with the Spirit's power, do you think that you can reach the goal under your own power? Have you suffered so much for nothing? Is that, if, if, if that's the way you think, your suffering certainly will, be, will have been for nothing. What about God, who supplies you with the Spirit and works miracles among you? Does He do it because of your legalistic observance of Torah commands or because your trust in what you heard and are faithful to it? Verse 6. It was the same with Abraham. He trusted God and was faithful to Him, and that was credited to, he, to his account as righteousness. Be assured then that it is those who live by the trusting and being faithful who are really children of Abraham. Also the Tanakh, foreseeing that God will consider the Gentiles righteous when they live by trusting and being faithful, told the good news to Abraham in advance by saying, in connection with you, all the going, the nations, will be blessed. And so we understand something very significant. Children, genuine children of Abraham, biologically or non-biologically, are the ones who are in connection with trust, with faith. Those who are actually um, being righteous, being um, justified by faith. And that is not to say, and I really need to clarify this, that is not to say that, um, you know, it, it, it was a, a, um, a Christian reformer and Martin Luther who said, by faith alone, by trust alone, by, by scripture alone, and he was quoting from the book of Romans. And that actually took a different understanding. And people took it upon themselves to think that there is nothing else to do only by to trust and do nothing about it. That is not what a Jewish rabbi is explaining in the first century through the book of Galatians. What he's actually saying is that faith is what really uh, stands before Hashem, our trust, and, and to trust Him and not to trust what the world is actually telling us. Because in those days, as in our days, there was a lot of idolatry. And one rabbi said that the reason why there were many idols is because those idols were competing for people's attention and ultimately uh, people's trust. And so Hashem is actually telling us, Thou shalt not have any other gods before me. And so that means that when we are putting our trust in luck, when we're putting our trust in the amount of money that I have, when we're putting our trust in something else, then we're not putting our trust in Hashem. And make no mistake, I'm not saying that putting our trust in Hashem means we should not do anything about it or work or invest or be productive because we're putting our trust in Hashem. That's not what the, the Torah is actually teaching and that is not what I'm saying. This is about deliverance. This is about trusting that God, that Hashem is the only true God. And therefore, therefore Abraham believed. And because he believed, that was credited to him as righteousness. And so those who believe in the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those who believe that Yeshua is the Messiah, are actually the children of Abraham. And so... What are we then are talking about? We're talking about Masay Abraham. And, and this is what I want to focus on. The deeds of Abraham. There is something very significant in um, of this story. The Midrash tells us that Abraham was on the third day after his circumcision. And he was in pain. And so, but even in the midst of pain, he shows traits that show greatness before Hashem. And so in order for us, I, I find it to be very uh, interesting to learn from our father. When I, when I studied theology and I was in Bible college and I remember um, one, of the, uh, one of the courses that I needed to take was uh, church fathers. And it was interesting because according to tradition in the Christian community, um, church fathers are 
are people that are totally disconnected from Judaism, people that are totally disconnected from the Torah. Um, they were people that made a contribution in the development of Christianity and certainly adds value. But they were, they were not necessarily our fathers, per se. Our fathers are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They are our fathers. And so we have to, we have to be able to understand the greatness of our fathers, and we have to study uh, them so we can mimic them and we can um, be a reflection of them so that we can rightly make a statement, Avram Avinu, our, our father Abraham. And so at times people like the leaders in the first century think that greatness before God is based on genetics or on how disconnected from the world they are by their spiritual disciplines and practices. Um, but that was not the, what we learned from, from Abraham, our father. Even today, we have people that are so devoted into prayer into fasting, into the studying even of the Torah. Um, but, but, but if they disconnect themselves from the, the real world, they're not necessarily mimicking Father Abraham. Uh, rabbi Pam, an Orthodox rabbi, says that, the, that Abraham actually raised a, a standard, and we call it you know, the, the level, the, the, the standard that Abraham actually set for us. And it says that if we somehow justify ourselves by the fact of saying, I'm studying and I'm going to yeshiva or I'm going to the Kotel or I'm going to um, Beit Midrash, I'm going to houses of study and, and I'm totally disconnected from the world and I'm neglecting my duties and I am not really connecting with the world. So what? It doesn't, it doesn't do anything because that's not what Abraham did. And so... Let me share with you a few traits, because there are many traits. But today, I want to share with you uh, the traits that we can learn today. Uh, only three traits that we can learn from Father Abraham. Uh, first trait we can learn from him is hospitality. And so the Torah says in Genesis 18, verse 2 and 3, Vayesa einav vayar veine shalosha nashim nitzavim alav vaya vayarotz likratam. It says, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw three strangers standing in short, a short distance from him. When he saw them from the entrance of his tent, he ran to greet them, bowing down to the ground. This is very interesting. Um, and, and the point right there is that he actually saw them and there is, there is a, a different translation when it's, this one says that he saw them. But the translation that I like the most is that he actually perceived, he perceived. So there's a big difference of seeing people from afar and perceiving something is different. According to the account, according to the story, we see how Abraham was in pain. It was the hottest day, uh, the hottest time during the day. And um, he was in his tent. And, but you know what? He was alert. And then he saw these three men standing. But it was not enough. He perceived. What was the, the aspect that he was able to perceive? He went to them. Even though he was in pain, he, he found an opportunity to serve others, the needs of others. That is why Father Abraham is great before Hashem. Because according to Judaism, Father Abraham was, was very, um, so much into hospitality. And he was always welcoming strangers. And some explanations and commentaries go as far as to say that the, the, the reason why he was, he was so much into hospitality was because he wanted to share about Hashem with every stranger. And a rabbi said once in, in, in a contemporary um, explanation, he said, how could it be that Abraham had mustard in his refrigerator? And he says, even though he did not eat mustard. Or, let's put it this way, and I think it made me laugh. How could it be that um, 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 uh, Ashkenazi rabbi could have jalapenos in his refrigerator? Um, there's, there is one single explanation. 
It's not for him. And it, that's, that's because he's always concerned about the fact that the possibility of someone else who might appreciate eating jalapenos, or in this case, in the point of this rabbi, as he was uh, sharing um, regarding this parasha, is that Abraham was concerned for the needs of others. He was not thinking for himself, but he was always thinking for others. So even though he was in pain, he was ready to take action, and he ran toward them. And again, one rabbi considers this Abraham's level, a person who is concerned for the needs of others. And how do we apply this principle? We don't have to go far and find that quote-unquote other person. We don't have to be um, looking for, you know, for, for that in, in different places. We can actually begin at home with our wives, with our husbands, our children, our siblings, our neighbors, and then we can expand thereon and find for opportunities to be just like Father Abraham. There is a big, a, 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 a huge distance in, in connection between Father Abraham, as we read it, in the book of Genesis, as in the first century, when the leaders are saying, our father is Abraham. Huge disconnection. And I find it very opportune for us this morning to actually reconnect and be able to learn about our father Abraham. The beauty of it, the, the, to, to practice hospitality, um, is very significant. And that was one of his traits. The second trait is that this is very beautiful. If you paid attention to the uh, to the parasha, let, let me go back and read it. Um, the second trade is this. It says, um, verse, verse 3, he said, My Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, please don't leave your servant. Please let me send, let me send for some water so that you can wash your feet. He was welcoming and he was providing for the needs then rest under the tree, and then this is the second trait. I will bring a piece of bread. Notice that he only offered, I will bring a piece of bread. He did not offer much. He said, I will bring a piece of bread. Now you come to your servant, refresh yourselves before going on. And they said, very well. They replied, do what you have said. The second trait that we learned from our father Abraham is that he offered the essential but in the end, he gave more than that. He actually offered them a banquet with the best. If you notice, he was, even though he was in pain, even though I don't, I don't, we don't see him thinking, oh my goodness, but if I give this, what's going to happen? Or I can do it maybe next, next week. Maybe if they come back, you know, we can do that next week. That is what set him apart. That is our father Abraham. And we need to learn from him. And I like that. I really like this second trade. This is, this is awesome. He offered the essential, but he gave more. Um, matter of fact, there is a part in Scripture that says that if you, if you offer, make sure that is a, a, a good offering. It's something that is, is, is bountiful. Um, because in return, you know, we, we get blessings that way as well. And we're not doing it for the return of, of the blessings, but we're doing it just because Father Abraham did it. Because he was filled with God's presence. And so he offered a piece of bread, but he gave them a banquet, the best. And the third, the third trait that we find is priceless. This is very significant intercession. The parasha deals, and we're going to save it for our midrash, but the parasha speaks about the one amongst the reasons that uh, the angels uh, brought before uh, Father Abraham was about the information about the destruction for Sodom and Amora. And so the question is, why was Hashem revealing that to Abraham, even though the scripture declares? Well, because we became friends. Well, because you and I have a relationship, I'm not going to hide things from you, so I'm going to share that with you. And if this is the case, then this is what's happening. So I, I got to let you know that I will be destroying these two cities because of their sin. And so what was the reaction of Father Abraham? He interceded for them. 
uh, the the rabbis of the of the Talmud, and even in our days, when 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 you get into those advanced courses, they they find something very significant, and they said, you know, from this part of Shah, we learned that that we can negotiate with God. <laughs> And I think this is very important, significant. Um, because if you develop a relationship, and then there, there are rights, and then we have uh, responsibilities, but we also have some rights. And so we notice how Abraham is actually interceding and, and negotiating, if you will, with Hashem. And this is when we read about, well, but Lord, you, you are the judge of all earth. What if there are 50 righteous? Are you going to destroy the city because of 50? And what about 40 and 30 and 20 and ultimately 10? And Hashem, being so gracious and so patient, He said, if there are 10, I will not destroy the city. Hence, we learned the Minyan, which is a, a, a group of 10 males in, in, in Judaism in order for um, a prayer group to exist. And so, interesting because it's not necessarily set in stone. That is just a norm that helps our communities to keep up with the fire of, of, of prayer every morning, every day. But again, this is why, according to the Torah and the commentators, Abraham and Noah, and not Noah, Abraham and not Noah, became the patriarch of the Jewish people. Why? Because Abraham was able to, he had these traits and he interceded. This is very significant. We should not take it upon ourselves to say, you know, like for instance in our days and what is taking place in America, whether your political affiliation, your, uh, your inclination towards one party or, or, or the other, um, we should not neglect the fact that we must intercede for all of them. And so this is something that we learn from Abraham. And so... A recap, let me tell you, Abraham's children must reflect his traits. So let us embrace these traits and, and, and raise ourselves to the greatness of our father Abraham, not becoming religious, but rather becoming great in the Masay Abraham and the deeds of Abraham. And first and foremost, by trusting Hashem through Messiah, because Father Abraham became a father multitudes because of his trust. And then be ready to perceive and run to do something for others. And you know what? Offer the essential and give more. And last but not least, always intercede for others. And you know why? Because the word of the Lord declares in Hebrews chapter 13, verses 1 and 2 from the complete Jewish Bible. Let brotherly friendship continue. But don't forget to be friendly to outsiders. For in so doing, some people, without knowing, have entertained angels. And I don't know, I, I really want to save that for Midrash. I'd like to hear your experiences. I'd like to hear how have you handled, and if, if you have ever practiced any of these traits, and I know, I know most of you have, but I think we can always take it to the next level. And I think that if we are to walk and um, this is exciting because uh, Letty was teaching the ladies this past Shabbat uh, about Sarah. And we are learning now from both of them. Both of them. Our patriarch and matriarch are actually teaching us the ways that we must walk before Hashem. And so let us, and let me wrap it up because time is uh, up here now. Let us keep up the eternal covenant from generation to generation by doing the deeds of Abraham so we can call him Abraham Avinu, Abraham our father. And so let's pray. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Avinu Shabbat Shamaim, our heavenly father, the importance of realizing that, that we are called by your name, the importance of of calling those righteous men and women before us that have set a path for us. And we, we, we learn a lot. And Father, today more than ever, we, we need to, to uh, awaken those traits and, and exercise those traits 
because that is that is what you desire. And all of that actually takes us back to the second greatest commandment. You must love your neighbor as yourself. Because in loving others, we are actually loving you. Because there is no way we can love our neighbor without having your love. And because you are love. Because rightly stated, God is love. And and so, Father, we we pray that every day as we are beginning the new cycle of the Torah and as we have embarked ourselves in understanding and studying um, those who were before us and this is, this is the foundation of those who are approaching you and there is a process that all of us can, that we need to be acquainted with. So Father, we pray that, uh, that you can help us to open our eyes and see and we can change our ways and we must not follow the ways of the world and we must not follow um, or be sucked in by a, a uh, superficial understanding of religion and thinking that we, in order for us to be great in your presence and holier, uh, we must disconnect from the world. Um, that is not the case. Abraham did not disconnect it from the world. He was, he was concerned about strangers because he wanted to reflect your glory. And so Messiah Yeshua was teaching us in the first century how people were actually um, calling themselves the sons and daughters of Abraham and also the sons and daughters of you. And so today we're no different. So Father, we ask um, for forgiveness in these aspects that we have neglected and help us, Father, to be sensitive and help us to be just like Father Abraham. So so we can perceive, not just see people, but perceive the opportunity to be concerned for the needs of others. Um, and Father, we thank you because this can only happen if your presence is in our hearts, just as it was in the heart and life of Abraham and Sarah and the patriarchs. In the precious name of our Lord Messiah Yeshua, Father, we praise you and thank you for your word. We praise you and thank you, Lord, for um, the teachings that we get from it. And um, we rejoice in your presence. In the name of Yeshua, Father, we thank you. And together we say, Amen.